Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Jordan Hefker, uh, and today I'm going to tell you about how we can use crowdsourcing to detect emotionally manipulative language. Let's get right into it. A long time ago, in an ancient America, it was once true that people subscribed to a number of name brand newspapers, such as the Los Angeles Times or the New York Times or something similar, and they would then have it physically delivered to their home. Okay, maybe this wasn't that long ago, but many still think of this era of the information ecosystem as sort of the glory days, the days where we didn't have any of the problems that we experience today. Uh, but in fact, uh, perhaps those pe the people who think that uh, are warped by nostalgia because the reality was that this information ecosystem was still rife with problems including a sensationalist tabloid media that resembles a lot of the clickbait fake news we see today, uh, yellow journalism, which was quite literally misinformation that started wars, uh, and even coordinated disinformation campaigns uh, like the Nazis, uh, the ring. And I encourage you to see bite work for a full history of that. And so I just want to start by contextualizing us in the reality that uh, this information ecosystem has always had problems. And those problems continue in 2020. Um, and while a lot of the way that we get our news has shifted online, uh, we still see a lot of misinformation, hate speech, and harassment uh, throughout our information ecosystem. Marwick and Lewis cataloged the different actors that participate in spreading this kind of information. And that included things like political actors, uh, such as Russian trolls on Twitter, uh, financial ones like the Macedonian teenagers trying to generate clickbait fake news for ad revenue, and even ideological actors uh, who are trying to push extremist ideas into our discourse and culture. And so while it will be the topic of research for many years to come for many researchers to address all of the problems in this information ecosystem, I address in this work one particular rhetorical strategy that many of these actors use to amplify their problematic content. And that is emotionally manipulative language. Let's take a look at an example of what I mean. This is a snippet from Tucker Carlson, uh, where he calls Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, a living fire alarm, a warning to the rest of us that we better change our immigration system immediately or else. That's uh, very sinister. Uh, using this, these dramatic words and phrases, trying to induce xenophobia within his audience. And the, the problem with this kind of content is that it causes reader or viewers who would otherwise maybe process the information logically and through um, slow and, and methodical um, methods. Uh, instead, they process it very quickly uh, because they have an emotional reaction. Um, and they, they, they make impulsive decisions as a result uh, that they may not otherwise have made, such as sharing the content or leaving an, an angry comment. And so it would be really useful if we could detect this kind of language because we could build interventions um, that could potentially stop the spread of this information throughout the internet. Um, but there's no way to do that yet. And so the focus of my work was to build a system that can consistently detect emotionally manipulative language. But this is really challenging because a lot of the content that we look at looks more like this content. This is an example of uh, a post by Camila. Uh, she describes the challenges that she's gone through while immigrating through the southern border, uh, the US border. Um, and it doesn't matter how you explain this information. Uh, it's just, it's emotional. Um, it's inherently emotional. And so for that reason, we call this intrinsically emotional content. And the main challenge will be, how can we disentangle this intrinsically emotional content from emotionally manipulated language? To get started on that challenge, we developed a data set. Uh, we started with news articles, uh, and we would take them and create a shorter version, um, usually like a, a small text snippet out of that, and then we would then take those text snippets and create a version that has little to no emotionally manipulative language. And then we would take that snippet and create another one that has a lot of emotionally manipulative language, all while maintaining the same information content across both snippets. And so now this gives us a clean data set where we have labels with and without emotional language while maintaining 
uh, the same informational content between uh, different paragraph pairs. And in order to uh, validate the validity of our data set, we handed these text snippets to a variety of, or a two journalists who then rated them according to a variety of different um, uh, aspects, including which of them has more emotionally manipulative language, which we found that they, were, they tended to be able to agree, uh, which has more intrinsically emotional content, and which is more likely to be publishable in a reputable news source. And so now we have a clean classification problem that we can try a variety of approaches on. And so that the next step was to try some off-the-shelf tools. And that includes things like emotion detection and sentiment analysis. Um, and we generally found that these approaches were not quite yet capable of detecting emotionally manipulative language. And this should come at no surprise as these problems, emotion detection and sentiment analysis, are not the same thing as detecting emotionally manipulative language. Also, they were trained on a different kind of data set, typically Twitter. Uh, so it's possible if we had a data set that was more related to our problem with better uh, labels that we could potentially make these approaches do better. Um, and one way that we might create that data set is to use crowdsourcing. And so we tried a really simple crowdsourcing approach where we simply just asked workers, how much does the paragraph intentionally stir emotion in the rear? If you would have them rate on a Likert scale from one to five, and then we would average the responses and use a decision threshold to decide if that average is above the threshold, then, it had, then we say that the paragraph has emotionally manipulative language. And if it's below it, then we say that it does not have emotionally manipulative language. This approach is nice because it allows us to be more aggressive or more conservative if we want to, or more aggressive depending on our use case. But we found that no matter what we do, the approach did not perform well. While we could get high recall if we use a more aggressive threshold, we couldn't get better precision. And that was due to workers conflating intrinsically emotional content with emotionally manipulative language. So let's take a look at an example to further understand what's happening. This was an example um, that I showed you earlier uh, that workers would have messed up. Uh, they would have conflated with emotionally manipulative language. And if you look at this example, it sort of makes sense why this is happening. If you ask them, why does the paragraph intentionally stir emotion in the reader, you can see that this is actually really challenging. Uh, it's really hard to disentangle where that source of emotion is coming from. Is it from the informational content of the paragraph, or is it due to the way that it's presented? And we know from psychology that when people are presented with challenging questions such as this, they typically substitute them with easier ones such as how much emotion does this paragraph make me feel? It's much easier and it would produce the wrong output. And to further explain what is happening here, let's look at an analogy. I'll use this analogy of an optical illusion. And if you take a look at that bar in the middle, and I asked you, is the right side of the bar darker than the left side of the bar? You may say yes. But if I remove all that additional context, you can see that the bar is actually the same brightness all the way across it. And so one thing we could do is pull from this analogy to create an approach that works in our scenario. So let's look at how I did that. We start with um, the going, going back to that original uh, paragraph that I showed you initially from Tucker Carlson. Uh, we introduced an approach that we call anchor comparison, where instead of asking workers to rate the amount of emotionally manipulative language exists in this original paragraph, we can instead ask them to try to remove it to rewrite the paragraph into a version that has very little or no emotionally manipulative language. And so with this new version that we call the anchor version of the paragraph, we can use it as a point of comparison to judge the original content, just by asking them how much more dramatic is the original compared to the anchor. And this approach allows us to, to make that comparison and see that the original has much more, but in the case that we showed did not work previously, workers would only be able to make minor edits to the original, uh, such as changing living in fear to just being afraid. And so when we asked them how much more dramatic is the original compared to the anchor, the difference would be very small, and this would come back as negative. And so now we have a really useful approach that we call anchor comparison, but how do we actually implement this in a system? Well, we could do that through two steps. If we introduce a text snippet, 
and we insert it into a component we call anchor transformation, meant to create an anchor version of the paragraph. We could then feed that anchor version of the paragraph into the comparison step, which then compares against the original content into a classification output, a binary zero or one. But how might we actually build that anchor transformation step? Uh, and so if to do that, we pull from the state of the art for copy editing. Um, this is in particular Bernstein's Soylent system, the find, fix, verify workflow. And then we add one additional step, the filter step, intended to reduce the amount of distortion that happens in the original paragraph. And so now we have a useful system where if we feed in a text snippet, we can find the portions that have emotionally manipulative language. We can have workers suggest potential changes to remove that emotionally manipulative language while maintaining the same informational content. And then we can have a different set of workers remove those edits that actually do change the informational content by distorting it. And then we can have a final step of workers picking the best edits that remove the emotion of language while maintaining the same information. And so now the output would be an anchor paragraph. And we can use that as a point of comparison to judge the original content. Again, rating on a Likert scale from one to five and using that threshold to determine if it does or doesn't have emotionally manipulative language. And so while I don't have the time to tell you about uh, exactly how we evaluated this whole system, I'll give you the high level findings. Uh, and that is that if you use iterations, you can improve the recall, uh, or you can use the agreement threshold to reduce the conflation within the filter step. So now I've showed you how we can detect emotionally manipulative language. But let me take a step back and explain the general class of problems that we've managed to solve by using anchor comparison. And to do that, let's look back at that Tucker Carlson example one final time. So if you look at this example, and you take a look at just the first phrase, a living fire alarm, this is one of the phrases that I've said that could be rewritten to remove the emotional manipulative language while maintaining the same information. And the reason that that is possible is because it's overlaying multiple messages on top of each other, including one where he's saying that she, being Ilhan Omar, is a, an example of how immigrants are ungrateful and quick to criticize. This is potentially a problematic stereotype, but it's made much worse when we add that additional message of the blasting fire alarm that's warning us that if we don't act immediately, that the whole nation will burn, our culture will be set on fire. It's much more dramatic and it induces a lot more um, urgency to do something. And so we call this kind of phrase that has multiple messages overlaid on top of each other a social reference. And this is the broad class of problems that anchor comparison is meant to solve. Other examples would be terms such as dirty crime-ridden cities, which has the literal meaning of dirty streets and alleyways, as well as the uh, racial connotations. Also migrant caravans, which has the meaning of you know, a line of cars, as well as um, Middle Eastern connotations. But in general, we say that social references refer to language that invokes connot connotations by overlaying parts of social and cultural contexts. And this is what anchor comparison was meant to solve. So today, I've told you about a new crowdsourcing approach that we call anchor comparison. That is the first crowdsourcing approach that can detect social references while mitigating conflation error. I thank you so much for your attention. I thank our sponsors for the support, and I encourage you to see the full paper for more details.